Good afternoon, everybody. Everyone enjoying the show so far? Yeah, good, yeah. <laughs> so you've probably seen the slide a few times. This is the I'm not a lawyer, please don't sue me slide. So just in case you haven't seen it yet, but uh, um, if, we, if you hear anything in here that you could consider a future, please take it with a grain of salt. I'm not a lawyer, please don't sue me. Uh, but what I am is I am an architect. Uh, I've been in the industry for about 29 years. Uh, I spent almost five years with New Relic now. Uh, I was very early on in the days of New Relic. But before that, I was with Amazon for seven years, both in Amazon Retail and Amazon AWS. And uh, if you're familiar with the AWS services, I built Elastic Beanstalk, it is one of the services I built. So I've been in the cloud computing industry for a long time and uh, uh, built service and microservice architectures and and I focus a lot of the things that I do and the things I talk about on availability and on scalability topics. And today I want to talk about the cloud. And I want to talk about the two different models that most people use when they build cloud-based cloud applications. I call it the static and the dynamic model. The static model is what I, is basically a better data center approach. And I want to talk about that first. So when we talk about a better data center, what we're talking about is um, using the cloud so the resources are allocated to specific uses. Much like you would allocate a server in your own data center for a particular purpose, you allocate a server in the cloud for a particular purpose, just like you do in your own data center. Of course, the provisioning process is a lot faster in the cloud, and that's one of the benefits of it. But you typically will allocate the resources and leave them allocated for a long period of time, just like you would in your own data center. And as such, capacity planning is still an important aspect of your work that you have to do in order to maintain this data center. And so why would you use the cloud simply as a better data center, just using this model? Well, you know, it's like I said, it's easier to add new capacity faster. And that allows you to build uh, in improved application availability. Um, often, one of the reasons why people first move to the cloud is because they want to have a redundant data center. That's the only reason they care about. And so, application availability. But sometimes that also helps itself from a compliance standpoint. Uh, a, a lot of people run into safe harbor issues with, for instance, needing to have an EU data center or nowadays an Australian data center, where you have to have data geographically located near where the customer is using it. Or actually, alternatively, in the US, some of the safe harbor laws around healthcare have the exact opposite concern. You have to have data in one location, and you have to have a backup location that's at least 100 miles away. And so the cloud can help you create those alternative data centers and using the cloud in this model is a very, very simple way to make that happen. So who's impacted by this? Who typically cares? When you, when you look at the two groups within your organization, the operations team and the development teams, who cares about using the cloud as a data center? Well, your operations team obviously does. Whenever they think about using a new data center, they have a bunch of questions they have to ask. You know, how does this data center help me scale my application or my apps run on it, et cetera, and, and how, well will, how well will they perform in this new data center? But your development team doesn't care less. To them, a data center is a data center. The fact that it's a cloud-based data center is completely irrelevant to them. A better data center using the cloud as a static data center is typically used to allow you to bring up new applications or new uses for applications in a faster manner. That's it, that's simple. Well, of course, we're gonna talk about monitoring. How do you monitor a cloud-based data center, a static data center? And the answer is really simple. It's just like any other data center. There is nothing magic about the cloud when it comes to monitoring it. I do get a question all the time, though, is, you know, the cloud obviously has their own monitoring built in. AWS's CloudWatch, isn't that enough? Doesn't that give me the monitoring I need to keep my application up and running? And the answer, of course, is no. It's necessary, but not sufficient. 
if we look at a, you know, just a real simple application, you know, a modern application is composed of services and microservices that typically have a mobile app or browser-based components on top of it. They're gonna run on the top of a server operating system that runs on top of either physical hardware or a virtualized hardware system. When you talk about what does the built-in cloud monitoring that you get with things like AWS CloudWatch, what, do you, what does that monitor? All it monitors is the virtual hardware. You get to see things like CPU utilization, disk networking, but it doesn't know anything about the OS that's running on that EC2 instance. So without knowing anything about the OS that's running on it, you don't get information about memory utilization, the virtual memory information, swap information, file system information, process utilization, configuration management. None of that, and of course nothing with your application itself, none of that is available through CloudWatch. You need additional tools to get that level of configuration management, or to get that level of monitoring, and tools like the new, uh, new Relic infrastructure monitoring, application performance monitoring, mobile, et cetera, are tools that can help give you that visibility, but of course those tools know nothing about the virtual hardware itself that it's running on. So only when you combine these two, two tools together in a cloud environment can you really truly understand how your application is performing top to bottom. So that's better data center. Let's talk about the dynamic uses of the cloud. When I talk about using the cloud as a dynamic tool, what I'm talking about is using cloud resources, but only the resources you need when you need them. You allocate and deallocate resources on the fly, rather than allocating an EC2 instance or a whole bunch of instances for a static purpose that'll last for a long time. You only use, allocate what you need when you need it. You terminate them when you're done. And as such, resource allocation starts to become an integral part of the application architecture itself. It matters when and where you allocate these resources, and the application cares where those resources are located. Resources are allocated, consumed, and deallocated, and the application is often either directly or indirectly responsible for that operation. So we took some data that we think you find interesting. Um, we obviously, one of the things we monitor is Docker containers. And since we're a SaaS service, we get some interesting statistics on combined utilization of all of our customers. So we took a look at all of our customers that made use of Docker. And what we found was, this is showing a chart of how long the Docker containers were running for, from start to termination of the Docker container, compared to the count of the number of, of instances, number of times that container ran for that period of time. And the longest running containers we have at the time we did this, which was a few months ago, were 833 days. That's a static container. But there's obviously a huge spike back in short time intervals. The average, by the way, was 200 days. But that one hour time interval is rather interesting. It's obviously the biggest spike. And so we took that one hour slice and we expanded it and looked at only the, the instances that ran for less than an hour. What we found was over a million containers, and using the sample set that we have, that's 11% of all Docker containers that we were monitoring ran less than a minute, ran for less than 60 seconds. So that's an application who has an entire application stack within a Docker container, where it boots that container, runs the, whatever, performs whatever business logic it needs to do, and terminate all in less than 60 seconds. This is what I mean by a dynamic application and a dynamic infrastructure. When you've heard all day long today about dynamic infrastructure, this is exactly what we mean. And it's not just Docker that does this. Uh, you know, EC2 auto scaling does this. Um, a lot of the AWS mobile and IoT APIs uh, encourage this as well. Load balancing, uh, dynamic routing capabilities, 
cues and notifications. How many people build AWS applications such that you create and delete cues on the fly? It's becoming more and more common. Dynamic infrastructure is about scaling. It's about building an application that uses the resources it needs and it allocates the resources it needs only when it needs them. So, how do you monitor a dynamic cloud? And the answer is very differently. You have some unique monitoring requirements you have to consider. For instance, let's look at a slightly more advanced but a similar sort of application, you know, multiple microservices sitting on top of a series of servers, virtual hardware, et cetera. And you still use CloudWatch to monitor the low-level virtual hardware of these services, of these uh, servers, I'm sorry. And you still use traditional New Relic monitoring components that'll give you the server operating system, they'll give you the application level monitoring or service level monitoring, browser, et cetera. And that covers most of your application. But what about this? Your application is now involved in the allocation and deallocation of infrastructure components. And that's very different than we've ever done before. That's very different than the static model. The thing you monitored 10 minutes ago, the Docker container that was running 10 minutes ago, the EC2 instance that was running 10 minutes ago, doesn't even exist anymore. How can you diagnose a problem that occurred if the resource that caused a problem doesn't exist? How do you monitor a Docker container that ran for less than 60 seconds an hour ago? And the answer is it's very, very difficult. But you still have to monitor the individual cloud components themselves. You still have to monitor the application. You still have to monitor the servers. You still have to monitor the Docker container. But you also have to monitor the life cycle of those components. It matters, wh it matters when a container ran. It matters how long it ran for. It matters where it ran. These things are now important to have this data available to you as you build and, and, and monitor and, and diagnose problems in your dynamic applications. So when we were talking about using the cloud simply as a better data center, we said this was an operations driven issue, right? Your development team didn't care less. But operations team were very comfortable in their typical uh, questions that they typically ask, um, and that they typically talk about when they talk about building a new data center. It's the same questions they ask for a cloud-based data center. But when you talk about using the cloud in a dynamic manner for a dynamic application, things get very different. Your operations team are now being asked questions and, being, and, and trying to an get answers to questions that they've never heard of before, like what is a container and why do I even care about it? And where does this thing that I was monitoring just go to? Operations folks are used to having spreadsheets of servers. You don't have spreadsheets anymore. You don't have static servers anymore. It doesn't work. But now not only is your operations team much more confused and much more scared about using the cloud in this model. Now your development team is directly involved in this process because they're building the applications that, that, that are making the application dynamic. The cloud architecture is a critical part of the application now. And developers are intimately involved in this process of deciding which cloud components to use and where they go. So you went from a model where your operations team were very comfortable and your development team didn't care to a model where your development team intimately cares and your operations team is scared out of their mind. The old model, your developers or your operations team had their spreadsheets, everyone was nice and honky-dory, honky it's all locked down and everything was, was exactly the way they like it, nice smooth, clean universe is now no longer that way. Your developers are happy because they get to do all sorts of cool new things. Your operations team 
don't know how to do, deal with this. They don't know how to build up a how to build an infrastructure, build an op and operate an infrastructure that runs these dynamic applications. This is new for them. And this is all about speeding up. It's all about building applications faster. You know, traditional data centers are good for building applications. Cloud data centers allow you to build applications faster. But a dynamic cloud is really where you get to build highly scaled, highly available applications in a much, much faster manner. And tools like EC2 and Docker containers are what make the dynamic cloud and what make it hard. EC2 with servers, do Docker containers are really nothing more than a process running. These by themselves are hard, but it's now getting harder. Lambda is the next step in the evolution of a dynamic cloud, where EC2 instances can come and go and you know, run for minutes or hours. Docker containers might run for seconds or minutes. Lambda functions run for milliseconds. Entire pieces of your infrastructure that don't exist until they're used and are gone milliseconds after they run. Lambda is the future for dynamic applications. So let's talk a little bit about Lambda. How many, first of all, how many people here are familiar with Lambda? Have, you know, probably most people are familiar with it. How many people have used Lambda? How many use it in a production environment yet? And that number is higher than it was six months ago, and it'll be higher six months from now. So what is Lambda? It's the newest entrance in what I call the dynamic cloud. It provides event, essentially event-driven compute capabilities. When Lambda was first announced, I really liked the way AWS described it. They described it as Excel functions. So the idea was the infrastructure in AWS was a series of cells in a spreadsheet. And as those cells change, functions execute. They kind of went away from that description, I think it, in some ways, maybe minimize a little bit of what Lambda was, but I think it was a really good description of what it, what it did. What it did, it provides an event-driven, change-driven uh, compute capability for AWS infrastructure, and it's all, it's all done with no infrastructure of your own. You have to provision serverless. I hate that term, and it all runs on a massively shared infrastructure. And the reasons why you use Lambda functions are you know, basically virtually no startup shutdown to cost, no provisioning, no, no cost to run these things. To, you know, all the cost is associated with the business function you're trying to perform. Um, they run in response to a state change. They're typically designed to run very small, very quick applications. Although I'm starting to see some applications that are a lot more complicated, they're really designed for these really short, really small functions. And so typically what happens is you connect a Lambda container to some sort of AWS resource, which is called a trigger. And that might be like an S3 bucket. You might trigger a function call on a file being, or an object being created in an S3 bucket. But it might be something also like an API gateway. And uh, that change will trigger a Lambda instance to run. That a Lambda instance will do something. Um, it might create another file in another bucket, or it might um, generate a response to the API gateway. But the real power of Lambda isn't that it does, these, does this real simple step. It does a small function that makes some small change in your AWS system. The real power is it does it at any scale. You don't have to know or care whether or not at any given point in time you need five of these things running or 5,000 of them running. AWS takes care of that for you. And it really does take care of that for you. The scale of these things can be immense. Let's look at a couple of real simple application uses for Lambda. Uh, this is almost straight from the AWS website, a photo management app. The idea is, let's say you're building a photo management app that allows you to upload photographs and it will create albums of thumbnail images of those photographs. Real simple app. Well, the upload process, you would typically 
send the uploaded photo to some sort of, of, uh, of application that you're running that will create the thumbnail. And you'd have to scale that application, scale that service on some number of servers in order to handle the, the upload rate that's happening on your application. You'd have to worry about how many servers it would take to run that. But with Lambda, you can simply have the files directly uploaded to an S3 bucket, have a Lambda script automatically take all those photos out of the S3 bucket, create a thumbnail, and put them into another bucket. And those thumbnails can be instantly available for viewing without any servers involved in that process. You don't care. Yes, it's running on servers, but you don't care how many there are. You don't care how AWS manages these things. If a million people are uploading photos at the same time, you can create a million thumbnails simultaneously. You don't care. You can also have another function that looks at uh, uh, meta tag attributes on, that, on that, uh, that same photograph at the same time and updates a database that's available for the rest of the application to use. So that meta tag functionality may be another example. But the important thing here is you can have essentially with very little work a upload capability for this application that can in virtually infinitely scale without you having to decide how many servers or how much infrastructure you have to allocate to make that happen. Pay, literally pay for what you use, literally at a single um, execution at a time cost. You don't have to pre-allocate anything. That's what they mean by serverless. I don't like that term serverless because people always get confused about what it means. But that's basically what they mean, is that you don't, isn't that it doesn't need servers to run, but you don't care that it needs servers to run. You don't know about those servers, and they're not your servers. Um, another example I'd like to show, this one I, I really like. This is a, imagine a mobile game. A mobile game where you um, have some sort of high score that's maintained by the, you know, by the system, a top 10 list of high scores. And so you need some way for the mobile game to send scores to a database at a central server and process those scores and return the top set of scores. Simple application, but typically it requires an infrastructure to make that happen. And now you have a great game, you put in the App Store and it goes viral and, every, and, and now how do you scale that or when do you scale that? Because now you don't have 100 users, you have a, have a million users using your, your game. And typically, a lot of games fail when they start getting successful because they don't build the, the right back end to make that happen, Pokemon Go. But it works. Um, <laughs> uh, but, but with this sort of a model, you can build the back end without building any infrastructure. Build a couple Lambda functions. You build a scalable back end database using something like DynoDB. And now you could literally support 10 users for a very, very tiny cost, or a million users for an appropriate higher cost, but you only pay for what you need and you didn't have to do anything to scale the system. This is the power of Lambda. You don't care about, um, well, yeah, this is the power of Lambda. But a question that comes up is, how do you monitor Lambda scripts? And the fact of the matter is, even though they kind of look sort of like servers running applications, they don't act like servers. And so rather than dealing with uh, Lambda functions as if they are servers or as if they're a piece of infrastructure, they look much more like an application. You care about things like execution time, throughput and failure rates, much more like you would think of a tr traditional application, not an infrastructure component. Lambda's different but if it's still within the same model. So, change is speeding up. Lambda is one step in an evolution of building applications faster that has a dynamic infrastructure that continuously changes. But even without that, with EC2, with Docker, dynamic infrastructures are here to stay, and they're all part about building applications faster. 
it used to be a, a long time ago that all you had to do to maintain and know your application was function, functioning and working correctly was look at the server metrics on a, a server monitoring application. Because the CPU load on your server stayed about the same. Maybe it went up during peak times and down a little bit otherwise. And you knew it worked because it stayed really consistent. And if there's ever any spikes, that was a problem. That's all you needed to do. Well, those days are over. Um, the rate of change of components is fast. The rate of change of your infrastructure is fast. You can't, there's nothing that's smooth and level and common about your application anymore. So you can't just monitor the server. You must monitor the entire application. You must monitor the server, you must monitor the application, the infrastructure, everything. And you need to monitor the provisioning process. And you need tools like New Relic to make that happen. You need tools like CloudWatch to make that happen. You need all those tools working together. So if you want to learn more about what I mean by the dynamic infrastructure and using building cloud-based uh, uh, scalable ca capabilities. Uh, I mentioned earlier I wrote a book by, published by O'Reilly called Architecting for Scale, and we're giving preview editions out for free upstairs during the lunch hours. You're welcome to come up, and, and I'm there. I was there today, and I'll be there tomorrow as well. And um, I'll sign a copy for you and talk to you about any of this. And uh, any other questions? I'm around the show. Feel free to stop by and, and, uh, and uh, ask me whatever you want. Thank you very much.